Good morning, church family. What just dawned on me is I came up to the pulpit that it has been three Sundays since I've been up here. And so I'm excited uh, to be up here. Pastor Daniel did an awesome job, didn't he, three weeks ago, sharing. And I appreciate him stepping in for me as I had the opportunity to go speak uh, for my dear friend, Pastor Daryl Ballar at Journey Church, are having a revival. And then uh, Jody spoke for two weeks, uh, for the second week, which really made my heart smile big time. Which, by the way, I don't know how many of you remember this, but it was about three months ago, I was sharing, I was pretty passionate in my heart, hadn't thought this through, but do you remember me saying this? I said, my wife is going to speak in two months. Who remembers that? Put your hand up if you remember that. Okay, check this out. It was later that night on prayer, Sunday night, that I'm gathered with a group that I pray with for an hour every Sunday night, and it dawned on me that it was exactly to the day, two months later, that they had the women's event. And guess what? She spoke at that women's event two months. That's awesome. I don't know what that does for you, but that fired me up. And I was super fired to see her back here behind the pulpit. That was so exciting. Uh, Then uh, last week, uh, Pastor Mark did an incredible job emphasizing what God has been speaking to our hearts for many months now, which is the importance of prayer. So I feel like the bases are loaded, (laughs) and I'm up to bat, right? And so the only thing I know to do is to just trust God and just invite his spirit to come um, and to speak to our hearts And I pray that I would just uh, speak with boldness today because I feel like I have a word that is not going to be a popular message, but I absolutely believe that it is a word that is from the Lord. And so can we just pray and just um, ask God to open our hearts, give us ears to hear. Can we do that right now? Come on, join me in prayer if you would. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you sent it, Lord, to heal us, Lord. Heal us, spirit, soul, and body. And so, God, we just invite this time, uh, Lord, and, and, and just consecrate it to you. And we ask you, God, to have your way, Lord, to renew our minds, Father. God, to give us the ears to hear what your spirit is saying to the church. And to, Lord, just stoke a fire in our hearts. Lord, one that cannot be easily quenched, God. And so we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for your presence that's already here. And we thank you for your word, Lord. We love you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, turn with me, if you would, in your Bible to Acts chapter 4. And as you're turning there, I just want to read you something that I came across a few weeks ago. But did you know that every week in the United States that there are 90 churches that close their doors. Now, that is 4,700 churches in a year's time. 4,700 churches that no longer exist. Not only that, but since the pandemic, 45% of regular churchgoers, now not people who just show up at Easter or Sunday or occasionally, but 45% of regular churchgoers have stopped going. Guys, those are alarming numbers. And it doesn't take long but to kind of look around at about how many people are here this morning, and that's about true here even in our own church body. Now, because of this reality, like, The church is trying to do all kinds of things. One of the things that I found that churches are doing, they're they're trying to be creative at attracting new people. See, used to in the old days, uh, all you had to do is to just get a sign or put out a banner somewhere, mention that you were having revival and people would just pack the place just because you put up a sign. Well, guess what? Those days are long gone. And so a lot of churches now have become creative in their marketing. One church that I read about had decided to transform its sanctuary into a bull ring. And for the Wednesday night service, the pastor rode a bull until he was bucked off. I think he only lasted a couple of seconds. But then he went up to the pulpit and preached. 
And evidently, the article actually said he preached a good sermon. I don't know, maybe the bull knocked some sense into him. But... <laughs> then another church decided to serve a steak dinner and give away guns as a door prize. I know there are a few of you that might be, uh, yeah, I'm up for that. But um, Oh, by the way, guess where this church was? No kidding, it didn't surprise me. I already knew it was a Baptist church in Kentucky. <laughs> You could go to church, read about Acts 9, and you might win a Glock 9. <laughs> now, why am I sharing this with you? Well, for a couple of reasons. One is because the less of the anointing and of the Spirit of God we have within our church services, the more the church is going to have to have gimmicks. But then, too, watch this. We should never have to convince God's people of their need to gather together. See, I've found that there's a reality that a church will either live or die by the people that come. And what I mean is, if a church is alive, it's because the people who come are alive and active. If the church is dying, it's because the people who come are themselves in that state. I actually heard about a pastor who took over a small church in Oklahoma and it wasn't going well for him. He tried everything that he could to try and revive this congregation and bolster the numbers and try to get the people to become active. But he tried and tried to no avail. And so finally, as one last ditch effort, he announced both to his congregation and in the local newspaper that this church is officially dead. And Sunday afternoon, he was going to have a funeral a burial service for this church. Well, Sunday afternoon, that church was packed. In fact, there was more people that came to this church than any service they had ever had before. Not only was every seat filled, but it said that people were standing outside trying to listen through the doorways and the windows. And at the front of the church was a casket with flowers and everything. And so the pastor got up, he gave a eulogy about the history of the church. But then he said, this church is over. It's dead. And this is its burial service. And once he was done, he invited all of those in the attendance to come by, pass by the casket, and give their last respects to the departed church. Then he said, in so doing, as you file past the casket, you will discover the reason and the death of this church. And as the people got up and they filed one by one past the casket and looked in, they all turned away in embarrassment for at just the right angle in that casket was a mirror so that every person who passed by saw themselves, their own reflection in it. Now, I share this story with you to let you know that the church is not a spectator sport. It requires collaboration. It requires the involvement of all. We should never, I should never have to have Ashley or Pastor Daniel beg people to serve. We are the church. The greatest in the kingdom is the what? Servant of all. The church has to be a team activity. It's got to require the involvement of all. If not, it will die. Are you hearing me? You see, if we are looking at the church through the eyes of the Western world, through the lens of American Christianity, and we think that just coming to church on a Sunday morning and hear good singing and good preaching is going to cause the kingdom of God to advance, we are, we're kidding ourselves. You see, you can't have a head without having a body. Are you with me? Like you can't run a race if you don't have legs. Hello? Hello? And if we're going to run the race that God has called Destiny Church to, it is going to require the involvement of us all. It can't just be a few key leaders who are advancing the kingdom of God. One of the things that I've always been passionate about is having a church where everyone has a purpose and everyone has a part to play. 
And I want you to know, by the way, that here at Destiny Church, there is a place for you. There is a God assignment with your name on it. And no one can carry out that role like you. Now watch this. Those of you that were athletes growing up, this concept should make sense to you if you've ever played in any type of team sport. But watch, a quarterback would not make a good nose tackle. And a guard would not make a good running back. Whenever I was in high school, um, my coach decided that he wanted to try and make me a linebacker. Now, some of you guys look at me, look at me and say, sure, I, I, I can see that. Well, only problem with that was that was about 75 pounds ago. <laughs> Come on, some of y'all can relate to that too, can't you? <laughs> but I wasn't a linebacker. I was a running back. I, I, sure, I was fast, but I wasn't big enough to stop a 245-pound fullback from running up the middle. But they needed a linebacker, and so I had to play that position for a season. Now, why am I telling you this? Because in churches all across our nation, we have people who believe that their purpose is just to live a good life, show up to church for about an hour or so, and then let the professionals do the work of the ministry. Do you want to know if you want to talk to the professionals? you know what my job is? It's to equip the, the saints for the work of the ministry. That's what Ephesians 6 says. To equip you guys for the work of the ministry. That, that's, that's the pastor's job, right? But watch this. And, and this is what is, is, is so important. Because like nowhere in the Bible do we see the blueprint that we just show up to church like sing a few songs, leave, and, that, and that's like, that's our faith in Christ. I mean, that's crazy. But rather, we see that every person has a God-ordained place in the body of Christ. Earlier this week, I met with my doctor, and he said something that I know that all of you guys have heard at one point. Uh, he said, make sure that you're eating a good diet and exercising regularly. How many of you know that that is no different? with our walk with Christ. Like we need to have a good diet, being sure that we're only allowing good things to come into our life and that we're actively practicing and exercising our faith. Hey, this is what produces growth, not only in our lives, but also in the advancement of the kingdom of God. And we see this here in the book of Acts. Like we see the church praying, Constantly spending time in God's word, listening to the apostles, teaching, practicing community, showing generosity by giving of their tithe and their time and their talent. And as a result, we saw an explosion of growth. And friends, I'm here to tell you that if we will live the way that the early church lived, we too will see the advancement of the kingdom of God in our lives and in our city. You see, the book of Acts isn't just a historical account of how the early church lived, but rather it's a blueprint of how we're supposed to live. It's the prototype of God's people. It's the OG church, if I can say it that way. And what we see here is a group of people who exist to advance the kingdom of God in their homes, their city, and their world. We see them becoming mature followers of Christ, Belonging to an authentic community and building kingdom causes. That sounds a little familiar right there, doesn't it? If you know our mission, vision statement, you, you just got it right then. All right, so I want us to pick up where we left off in Acts chapter 4. By the way, if you are just joining us, we've been on a series called All In, where we are going through the book of Acts, just verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and it's taken us about six weeks or seven weeks now to get to Acts 4. Bless God, we'll eventually get through it. But there's so much good stuff here, so much good stuff. Um, let's start in Acts 4, chapter 1, verses 4. The scripture says, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now, I want us to just pause this minute and look at what we just read. At the end of Acts chapter 3, we read about Peter speaking to a large group of people at a place called Solomon's 
portico or Solomon's porch. Solomon's porch was a wood-roofed, double-columned alcove, which was on the east side of the temple near the courts of the Gentiles. And so what that means is, is that the Jews would have heard him, the women would have heard him, and the Gentiles would have heard him. So this would have been a very strategic place to preach the gospel, like a place that would have great reach. Now we begin chapter 4 by reading, and as they were speaking to the people. Now I want you to just underline they right there in your Bible. And as they were speaking to the people. First, I want you to notice that Peter isn't the only one doing the speaking here. That's the reason that I'm not the one who's up here preaching all the time, but I have Pastor Daniel up here and Pastor Jody up here and Pastor Mark up here and Coach Carter and different ones coming up and speak, okay? But it says that they were speaking. And this is important to notice because it just goes to further validate what I just mentioned earlier, and that is that everyone has a role and that everyone has a voice and a place to belong in the kingdom of God. But look at what the scripture says next. It says that the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, and they were greatly disturbed because they were teaching and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Can I just say that the gospel does that? Like, it greatly disturbs people. Because when you shine a light in the darkness, it reveals and exposes things that are hidden. That's why Jesus said in Luke 8, 17, For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will be made no- or that is known and come to light. How many of you guys have ever went out into your shed before at night and you turned on the light only to see a bunch of bugs all of a sudden just scattering once the lights are turned on? Ever had that happen? Well, when we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, it often causes people to scramble. Like earlier this week, my washer gave up the ghost on me. And so we got to go and have the wonderful experience of going to a laundromat, which I've not been to in the last 20 years. That was pretty interesting. Um, But when we got there, Jody had brought a book with her, and she started reading it. And, of course, me, I'm scouting out all the people that were there in the laundry room that I could go walk and talk to. And, of course, that's the difference between an introvert and an extrovert, I guess. But um, I started talking to this guy. And come to find out, he was a Jehovah's Witness. Now, for those of you that know me, you know that I was like a kid in a toy store. I'm telling you, um, this guy didn't know that I was a pastor, so at first he thought that he was going to witness to me. (laughs) And uh, then I opened up the Word of God and began sharing truth with him. And then all of a sudden, kind of like those bugs that scrambled when the lights get turned on, you should have seen this guy. He was just perfectly folding all his stuff until I started speaking truth to him. And I've never saw someone fold clothes so quickly in all my life. (laughs) Friends, listen, when we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ... We wage war in the heavenlies. A spiritual battle takes place when the word of God is preached and it penetrates at the soul level. Like it's at this place where the souls of men and women are on the line. Now I tell you this because when you share Jesus with your neighbor, with a stranger, with a coworker or a family member, you should expect that you are going to get opposition. As a matter of fact, what we see here in Acts chapter 4 is the beginning of the persecution of the church. Like on one hand, we're seeing miracles taking place and we see notable signs uh, that's happening at the outpouring of of God's spirit at Pentecost. And here in Acts chapter 3, we read about a man who's been lame since birth, who God healed, and no one could even deny the miracle. But the preaching of the gospel and the carrying out of the Great Commission, it greatly disturbed the establishment. Like, this is the first recorded persecution here in Acts 4 since the the resurrection. And this persecution continues for about 300 years with the church facing some of the worst and most notable persecutions in its history. Most 
historians point to about 10 waves of persecution, uh, starting with Nero around 67 AD, where the Roman Empire comes against Christianity. And then it culminates with Emperor uh, Diocletian in Rome's longest and bloodiest persecution of Christians. And when I say persecution, I'm not talking about they've laughed at your fish sign on your car, okay? That might be some persecution that we might get here in, in America, but they had serious physical persecution. I encourage you to go read uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs or, or Jesus Freaks. Um, some of these stories are in here. Um, but these guys, were they were beaten. They were scourged. They were beheaded. One of the Caesars made Christians wear wax shirts and then lit them on fire as living candles in the gardens of Rome at night until they died in the flames. Emperor Nero would take the skins of freshly killed animals and sew them around men and women of faith, Christians, and have wild dogs consume them alive. I won't share no more because some of them I can't even share because there's People under 18 here, but it's that bad. And this marked 300 years of persecution that the church faced. It all starts right here in Acts chapter 4. But here's what I want you to see this morning, to hear this morning, and that is that persecution is still happening all over the world today. There's been a steady stream of it, and it is, it's increasing, church. I'm telling you, it's increasing. I mean, we've all heard reports of what's happening with ISIS and extreme Islam where they've had beheadings, crucifying, doing some of the very things that we read about that Rome was doing in the first 300 years. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this for the same reason that Paul said it in 2 Timothy 3.12. Paul says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Like if you don't ever suffer any persecution in your life, then you might want to ask yourself if you really are living a godly life. Because at some point in your walk with Jesus, you will suffer persecution to one degree or another. Like maybe not to the degree of what we uh, have just uh, mentioned here and in, in some of the things that, that we've read here, but when you live a godly life and you proclaim the gospel, it's always going to disturb the status quo. When you declare with your mouth and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, that definitive stance sets you as a separatist. And it speaks against the message that many others are declaring, saying that there are many ways to God. No, there is only one way to God, and that is through faith in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a good place to say amen from this church. So back to Acts 4. We read that they arrested Peter and John. But then in verse 4 it says, But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. By the way, how did we know that there were 5,000? Because someone counted, right? I only address that because I hear some people say, Oh, we don't count how many people come to church. Well, the early church did. So I'll let you go rebuke them, I guess, right? But... I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of like saying, well, I don't look at how much money is in my bank account. I just go and spend it. Don't even take a look. That, that's, that's ridiculous. No, that's not our focus is numbers just for numbers sake, right? But we need to be good stewards of what God has given us. Yeah. Like, can I tell you, we, like, we keep, like, I'm going to know how many people are here. Not a lot today, right? Uh, I can be honest. But you know what? We're going to keep counting today. You know why? Because that's how we are able to determine how much communion do we need to order uh, to make for everyone, right? We need to make sure that we've got enough teachers uh, to, to minister to and disciple our kids. And yes, that's what we do with our kids. Like, we don't babysit them. We're raising up an army here. We're raising up believers, right? We need to recognize when we see growth coming so that we can be prepared for that growth. For example, if all of a sudden we realize that there's 18 new people that come on a Sunday and we see that trend, well, guess what? In a little over a year's time, we're not going to have enough seats for everyone, so we got to start making plans for that. Are you all with me? Are you following where I'm going with this? But watch, what I really want you to see here is that in the middle of persecution, people were coming 
to Christ. Guess what? That's exactly what's happening today. Because I just read this week, mind-blowing to me, that Christianity is exploding in China. Now, China is undergoing some severe persecution. But watch this. China had reportedly... I know it's sometimes when you throw out numbers, it's hard to grasp whenever you throw out this or that number, and you're like, oh. But try to really think it through for a moment. Ten years ago, China had reportedly 22 million believers, okay? But now researchers say that there are somewhere close to 130 million followers of Jesus in China. So why is Christianity declining in America, but it's exploding in China? Might I propose that where persecution exists, the gospel flourishes? I think that oftentimes we pray that persecution toward the believers will end. But the Bible has already told us that persecution, it's, it's going to happen. It's not going to end, not on this side of heaven. Why? Because we are actively engaged in a spiritual battle. Now, someone might ask, well, why isn't there persecution here in the church? It's <laughs> a good question. Well, maybe, just maybe, it's because we've kept the message within the four walls of the church. We've not taken the gospel out to the marketplace and into the workplace and to our schools. Like, I was just watching, and man, I hope you guys hear this. I believe that who's here today is supposed to be here. You know, I watched a video just this past week of a pastor in Gatlinburg, and I watched the video lest someone thinks, well, no, I watched the video. A pastor in Gatlinburg, who was share Gatlinburg, Tennessee, who was sharing Jesus with people on the public streets in Tennessee. Tennessee, y'all. Okay, we're not talking about New York or San Francisco or L.A. And he wasn't using an amplified device that broke any city ordinance. So there's no amplified device. He was just simply walking up and down the streets and sharing Jesus with people. And three law enforcement officers showed up threatening him with disturbing the peace. Like, evidently, they said that his message was offensive to people. And I heard his message. He was just preaching grace. <laughs> and so they told him that he had to speak quietly or risk, uh, risk being arrested. There's whole things out there. You, this is one of so many. But here, you see, here's the problem. Church, we are called to proclaim the good news from the rooftops so that all can hear. Look, we all watched as certain states over the past two years tried to, and it tried their best to shut churches down from gathering together and practicing their faith. And you know what the sad thing is? A large portion of the churches complied. But I want you to watch what happened when Peter and John were arrested and were charged with no longer speaking in Jesus' name to the public, but before the authorities. What did they do? Well, let's just read. Acts 4, 5, it says, And on the next day, the rulers and the elders and the scribes, okay, that's the authority of that time, they gathered together in Jerusalem with Ananias the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly order. So everyone was there. And when they set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter Filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, right there's part of the problem. We don't have the Holy Spirit in our churches today because we're scared to talk about him. Hello? He's become the forgotten God. God the Father. God the Son. God the fill in the blank. Yeah, the same people who declare that they believe that don't practice it. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, 
whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which men must be saved. Now, I want you to just try and picture this just for a minute in your mind. Peter and John are being arrested for a kind deed that they had done for this lame man. They aren't inciting violence. They aren't even speaking out against the establishment. They are just proclaiming Jesus. And now they're brought before the rulers, the elders, the scribes, and all who were there of the high priestly order. And when they were asked by what power they did this miracle, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, delivers the gospel to them with boldness and conviction. I don't know about you, but I want that kind of boldness and conviction. Amen? The kind that will not cower whenever opposition comes. The kind that know the God in whom they serve. The kind like the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who refuses to bow to the ways of this world. The scripture goes on to say in verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now this verse right here has always meant a lot to me because I wasn't the top of my class. Like I was somewhere near the bottom. Truth be told, I'm just grateful that I graduated. But I want you to see this right here. God chooses the things that the world considers foolish in order to shame those things that are, we think are wise. God chooses the weak things of this world to shame the strong. But I want you to catch what it says right there in the last sentence. It says, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Friends, when you spend time with Jesus, People will recognize it. And if they don't recognize it, it's probably because you've not been spending time with Jesus. I love you. Is it okay if I challenge you this morning? Is it okay if I don't give you a sugar-coated message this morning, but I challenge you to be the man and the woman of God God's called you to be? Because that's how we're going to win this city. Are you with me? it wasn't because of Peter and John's pedigree or their education that caused the religious leaders to be astonished. But the Bible says that it was because of their boldness. And they quickly connected that thought with the fact that those men had been spending time with Jesus. Church, there is a recognizable trait that comes as a result of spending time with Jesus. Proverbs 28.1 mentions it. It says, the righteous are as bold as a lion. See, we think that boldness is something that just comes with an extroverted personality, but watch this. I know a lot of extroverts that are cowards. And I know a lot of introverts that are as bold as a lion. (laughs) Like, trust me, I married one. Let me ask you something. What do you think our nation would look like if those who claim the name of Jesus spent time with him in prayer and in his word each and every day? What do you think that would look like? I'll tell you what I think will happen. Two things. One, we wouldn't have to come up with gimmicks in order to get people to come to church because we're talking about Christians right now. Are you with me? Right? No, what we would do, though, is we would see believers who were free, like truly free, who would then go out and boldly start a meaningful conversation about Jesus with the lost world that's around them. But then the second thing that we'd see, and I know this is the part that you don't want to hear, but it's the part that you need to hear, and that is that opposition will start knocking on your door. Because Satan is not going to allow us to advance the kingdom of God without trying to stop our advance. Now, I know that this may sound radical to some, 
But this is just biblical Christianity. This is us living how the early church lived and how we're called to live. You see, the world is riding on the merry-go-round of normal. But it ain't merry and it ain't normal. Like normal is broke, depressed, and medicated. I don't want normal. I want Jesus. I think that our problem in the church today is that we just want to try and make good moral citizens our goal. But our goal is to make disciples of Jesus Christ and to raise up a people who will be bold witnesses for his namesake. Let's look back at our story, Acts 4, 14. It says, but seeing the man who had been healed standing before them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Isn't it interesting that when you proclaim the name of Jesus and you stand on his truth, others, they don't, they don't know what to say. Just like that Jehovah Witness that when I started bringing truth out to him and he realized that, oh, wait a minute, Jesus really isn't Michael Archangel. He really is the son of God. They didn't know what to say, right? Seeing the man who was healed stand beside him, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them, and they charged them to speak or teach to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now, let me ask you something. What would you do if the authorities told you that you could no longer share the gospel or even talk about Jesus? Then you may say, well, but Pastor Chris, that would never happen in our country. Well, you know what? If you believe that, I got some oceanfront property to sell you in Kentucky. (laughs) Friends, it's already happening in our country. Sure, not to the degree of of what it's happened in other countries or what we read about earlier, but watch this. History has a way of repeating itself, especially when we don't learn from it. There's an old illustration that we used to share as youth pastors uh, to the, the teenagers, and the illustration went a little something like this. Do you know how you cook a frog? You don't drop him in hot water because if you do, he'll just jump out. But what you do is you put them in comfortable water temperature and then you slowly turn up the heat and he won't realize what's happening and before long, he's cooked. Well, the church in America has become that frog that's been placed in the comfortable water. And for those that have the eyes to see, like the temperature is slowly being turned up. Are you hearing me? For example, separation of church and state has been redefined as don't share your faith with anyone because it might offend them. Don't tell them that they're a sinner in need of a savior because if you say that they're a sinner, you're promoting hate. And that's considered hate speech. And if you think that what I'm saying right now is silly and far-reaching, I love you, but you're naive. Let me read you some real-life examples of things that are currently happening in our country. I feel like I'm the guy who's sounding the alarm. I pray to God you hear it this morning. There was a street preacher, and I did the investigative work on this too, just for those of you that, what's the real story? There's a street preacher who was recently arrested in Seattle, Washington, after authorities reported, reportedly deemed him a public safety risk for simply reading scripture aloud at an event commemorating gay pride. And all he was doing was simply reading the Bible aloud. He was not aggressively preaching. He was just simply reading scripture. Another story that I came across was uh, in North Carolina, a group of people who were arrested for simply praying outside of an abortion facility. Now, for those of you that are saying, well, what's really going on? Because don't we have that tendency, right? Okay, well, I looked it up and, and like, did my investigation, make, make sure I did before I preached it from the pulpit, right? <laughs> but let me tell you something. You know what they were, was really going on? They were just praying. That's what was really going on. Let's gather together and let's pray. But then they, uh, they pulled them together and the city attorney told them, if you want to pray, this is, this is, by the way, quote what he said, you can just go home and pray and speak. 
True story. Which sounds real reminiscent of what we've been hearing over the past two years as God's people wanted to gather together and pray. Hello. Christians all over the world were told, if you want to pray, do it at home. If you want to gather, FaceTime or Zoom people. But the problem with social distancing is this. Christianity and social distancing are not compatible. Yes, I said it. Let me just go ahead and double down on it. Christianity and social distancing are not compatible. The very tenets of our faith prove this as true. Fellowship. Water baptism. Communion. Discipleship. The laying on of hands. Evangelism. These things can't be done in the context of social distancing. Yet many believers were championing this push. And now we wonder why 45% of those who used to go to church regularly no longer attend. Church, I'm sounding the alarm and letting you know that the temperature is slowly being turned up on believers and they don't even realize it. You want to know the reason why? We already read it. Because the gospel disturbs people. Hey, unbelievers will always find reasons to stop Christianity. They will deem it whatever they can unsafe, right, if necessary. Look, can I just tell you that the early church, the early Christians, they met in way more unsafe conditions than we faced in the last two years. But like, since when does the gospel bow to our fear or even to our safety? I had a pastor acquaintance. I emailed him, and I got the full scoop of what was going on, so it wasn't just what you're seeing on major news network. Actually, it wasn't even presented in major news network. None of these things were. You had to read them in, like, small local town stuff because, um, yeah, the big media is not going to throw it out there. But I had a pastor acquaintance in Kentucky who had his church parking lot covered with nails by the state police. And on Easter Sunday, there was a massive amount. You can look this stuff up. There was a massive amount of state troopers surrounding his church, ready to arrest any who dared to join other brothers and sisters in Christ as they gathered to worship their risen Savior. By the way, when he sent me the email, the pastor, and let him know I was praying for him, it was way worse than the article that you... And it's always like that, by the way. Like, don't believe the media. I mean, look, I know that fake news has become a cliche, but oftentimes it is fake when you start diving in to what's being written, okay? And you start talking to people that were there and witnessed it, all right? Guys, I could literally, like literally, give you a hundred real-life examples. If you want them, I'll send them to you. I'm not going to take it up for time's sake, but hundreds right now of things that are happening in the past few years in our country as a result of Christians just practicing their faith. Peace on earth and goodwill toward men has been interpreted as, you hate me. The proclamation of the gospel always has, always will, disturb those in darkness. (laughs) As a matter of fact, if you find yourself being disturbed by what I'm saying today, you might want to check what camp you're in. You say, what do you mean camp? Are we us and them? I'm talking about the enemy's camp. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the enemy's camp. The enemy is the one. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Hello? Church, I'm not apologizing for my boldness this morning. As a matter of fact, you know what? I choose to position myself and align myself the same as Peter and John. And I want you to notice how they responded whenever the authorities came to him and said, shut it down. Can't do it anymore. No more. Listen, listen to what it says. Acts 4, 19 through 20 says, But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Church, I'm telling you that we are now living in a time where you've got to decide whether you're going to listen to what man says or what God says. Whether you're going to choose to be politically correct, 
or be biblically correct. And just in case you don't know what is biblically correct, let me just set the record straight. Abortion is not the will of God. Sex outside of a married man who is married to a woman is not the will of God. Getting drunk is not the will of God. Lying, cheating, and stealing are not the will of God. Being greedy, full of pride, and selfish are not the will of God. Now, each of us was some, if not all of these things at one point in our life, right? As a matter of fact, now watch this. There may even be some of you here, you're still doing some of these things. And to you, can I just first say that you are welcome here? You are welcome here. Like the church isn't a place for perfect people, but a place for imperfect people who wants to have an encounter with a perfect God. And when we have that encounter, it changes everything. Like it doesn't matter how you were born. Everything changes when you become born again. Hey, I'm so grateful that God accepted me in the condition that I was in. But I am also grateful that he didn't leave me in that condition. Faithful is he who began a good work in us to bring it about to completion. And so watch this. If you're here this morning or you're watching online and you still have struggles, guess what? God's not done yet. If you still have propensities or tendencies, God's not done yet. If you still deal with pride, being selfish, and not being patient, guess what? Your pastor still struggles with those things. <laughs> but what's important to know is who God has called us to be. You know what? I may not be who I want to be, but thank God I'm not who I used to be. And God is doing a work, and he wants to do a work in us. One to where he calls us out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. To know what is truth and to allow that truth to have its perfect work within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Church, I have no greater desire as a pastor but than to see people come to know Christ, but then live in the freedom that Jesus intends for them to have. But what we've got to recognize is that our adversary, the devil, is going to try and prevent that from happening at every front. This is a message for another day, but watch. Satan's goal, his ultimate goal, I believe, is to infiltrate what has been called the seven mountains of societal influence. Let me know what I'm talking about, which I'll tell you what they are. It's it's religion, family, education, government, media, arts and entertainment, and business. But watch this. Are you ready? As the church we too are called to those seven facets of society. But if we want to see a nation transformed, it's only going to be if we go and preach the gospel. Man, I feel like Wyatt Earp right now just wanting to deputize you and say, go, right? I think that's what Jesus said, right? Go, right? Preach the gospel. Make disciples who then make disciples. And the people that you're discipling, tell them to go out and to make disciples. And let's see some explosion of Christianity, and let's see it reversed here in our country. I love my country, church. How many of you love your country? I love my country. I I don't want to see, as we say the cliche, uh, our country go to hell in a handbasket. I want them to know Jesus. I want them to go to heaven. I want to spend eternity with them, amen? How many of you are with me on that? Come on, stand to your feet with me if you would. By the way, for those of you that don't know the rest of the story, in Acts chapter 4, they released Peter and John, who went and then told of all the things that happened. And then in verses 23 through 31, it says that they prayed for boldness. So they come out of this. They recognize what's going on. I pray to God that you recognize and that some of your eyes were open today to some of the things that is happening in our country. 
And what did they do once they recognized, oh, wait a minute, man, there's some persecution that's come against us. They're trying to stop us from speaking the name of Jesus. So what did they do? The Bible says that they went and they prayed for boldness in order that they would continue to speak the word of God, that they would not allow anything to cause them to cower or have a spirit of fear on them, but rather a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Verse 31 says, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. You know, when you pray, things shake. I said, when you pray, things shake. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. If that's too much King James for you, let me just say, when you pray, something has to break. I said something has to break. So the place was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. This is my prayer for us, church, that we will be bold that we will refuse to bow down or to be silenced, but rather to declare the name of Jesus and to proclaim the gospel with every opportunity that we have. Now watch this. That kind of boldness only comes, only comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so here's what I want us to do right now. Can we just ask His Spirit to come and to cause us to be those bold men and women. And watch this. It doesn't, it's not something that we say, oh, maybe, maybe we can ask God and then maybe sometime down the road, like a year down the road or three years down the road, then maybe I can go out and then maybe I might be able to share the gospel. Today is the day of salvation. Today, people are dying that do not know Jesus Christ. Open your mouth. Start a meaningful conversation with them about Jesus. Look, if you don't know what to do, then just simply share your testimony. That's something they can't argue with anyway. I had three months by one doctor, another saying I maybe had a year to live. I'm here today. I've got a reason to, you got a reason to thank God because you're alive today. So guess what? You've got a reason. You've got a reason to share about the goodness of God. And so here's what I want us to do right now. I want to pray boldness over you. Church, can I just be honest? I want to see this place filled with souls that are, that are just free and that come to, I want, the dr I want drug addicts in here. I do. I want them in here. I do. I want the homeless coming in here. I want the ones that other churches, that they, they, they like people who's all dressed up and, and it's going to come in and make their church look pretty. This is a hospital, not a country club. And it's time that we qu quit trying to treat the church focused on that gum fog machines, big screens, and skinny jeans and think that that's going to reach people. And if we can just be cool enough, then, then the world will, will follow Jesus. No, we've got to serve the world. We've got to love them. We've got to lay our life down for them. But it starts with us proclaiming the name of Jesus and not committing the sin of silence, if I can say it that way. I know that's strong words, but it's time for the church to rise up. Will you be with me, church? Then let's ask the Holy Spirit to fill us because it's only by the power of Spirit that we can go out from this place and do it. Amen? Father, we ask you to baptize us afresh in this place. Fill our hearts with your love, with your passion. God, stir us, oh God. Lord, may we never, Lord, succumb to the sin of omission and of silence, God. But may we stand up for truth and for righteousness. Lord, may we take care of the widow. May we take care of the orphan. May we take care of the poor. May we be givers and not greedy. May we lay our life down before you. For God, you laid your life down for us. And God, you are worthy of it all. So precious Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come even now, even now, that you would breathe on our hearts, God. Breathe on our minds. Breathe on our spirits, God. Hmm. Let your peace, Lord God, flood us like a river. Let rivers of living water flow from our innermost being even now, Lord.